Before we jump into today's video, I want to give a huge shout out to today's sponsor, Easy Roller Dice, with their stunning new Kickstarter, Heroic Dice of Metallic Luster, uh, which is live right now, right this very moment. If you're anything like me, you are thrilled to be back playing games in person with your friends and the feel of throwing actual dice again. And Easy Roller has the absolute perfect way to celebrate that wonderful occasion with these beauties. Hey, metal dice are cool, but there's no doubt they can be a little on the bland side from time to time. But these heroic dice are just incredibly stunning. I mean, look at them. And I can't believe how many variations Easy Roller is offering by making every single design here available for backers from day one. None of these are locked behind some stretch goal. Oh yeah, and they're launching their new adventure boxes and dice coffers too, to help you keep all of your dice nice and safe and tucked away, and they've even included a place to keep that miniature as well. All right, now down in the description of this video, you'll find that special little link that'll take you to everything you need, and by using that link, it'll let Easy Roller know that I sent you over, which is really a great way to help out the channel. So thank you, Easy Roller Dice, for continuing to be a part of the Taking 20 team. Hey, Cody. Want to join my uh, new Dungeons and Dragons campaign? We're going to play Thursday nights and uh, we need one more. Hmm, Thursday nights? I could probably make that work. Great, we need a healer. While the design team for Dungeons and Dragons 5e went out of their way to try and make the game as really as playable as possible without requiring a dedicated healer for every party, there's no doubt that having one for a D&D party can certainly make things easier over the course of a campaign. But there's a lot of nuance to playing a really great healer for your party. And for those of you out there who may be playing the healer for the very first time, or maybe even some of you vets who don't have a lot of experience in this particular role and want to brush up on your play, that's what this video is going to cover today, as I'm going to talk about a few different tips and tricks for your next game of D&D for all of those dedicated healers out there. So let's talk about mastering the role of the party healer. This first strategy we need to work on is understanding the mechanics of dying and healing in D&D 5e. I've talked a lot about this over the past month, and it's certainly relevant again here in our healer role. If a player has one hit point, they are every bit as effective in combat as they would be if their health were full. Additionally, we need to really understand the game mechanics of how the death saves are being handled at your table. That's particularly important there because this will be a lot different if your DM runs a group with their own rules or if they run rules as written. For argument's sake, let's just talk about rules as written in this video. When someone drops, they begin to take their death saves on their turn. Three failures and they die, three successes and they stabilize. Rolling a one gives them two failures. Rolling a 20 brings them back up to one hit point at the start of their turn so they can get up and fight, true story. In addition, they gain the unconscious condition, which does the following. They auto fail strength and deck saves, attack rolls have advantage against them, and any attack that hits them is a crit if and only if the attacker is within five feet of them. Now, this is important. If they take damage while knocked out on the ground, they take an automatic death failure. However, critical hits are two failures and only critical hits are two failures. So let's put it all together and move on to our second strategy, which is to always choose the best target for your healing at the right time. Sometimes when things get hairy, we're going to have to make tough choices on, on who to heal, or perhaps even if we should heal someone or not, it's going to happen. But the question is, is how do we make those decisions? Well, first off, we need to assess the current danger to the dropped players. Let me ask you a hypothetical. Say we have two non-healing party members go down back to back. One has an evil mage standing right next to them and the other has a ghoul standing next to them. And just for clarity, the ghoul has been making a single attack every round as it doesn't have the multi-attack feature. So who do we heal? The correct answer is that we heal the one next to the ghoul because the ghoul is going to get advantage on that attack. The caster will only get advantage on spell attacks. However, any spells they cast with the saving throw 
will not be able to crit our ally. And so there are better odds that apples to apples, the player being targeted by the caster will have a higher chance to live than the player continuing to be attacked by the ghoul. Can the caster use a spell attack crit dealing out those two horrible death failures? Then the player rolls their save on their turn, fails it, and then dies? Yes, absolutely. But there's at least a chance there that the caster doesn't have any more spell slots for a spell that uses a spell attack, whereas the ghoul is guaranteed two death failures if he attacks the down players on his turn and he hits that turns into a crit that crit will become two death fails the same concepts can be applied to understanding these attacks in other instances if the caster was now standing 25 feet away the odds that the first player survives now increases even further this is because the prone player now gives disadvantage to ranged attackers if they are not within five feet so the advantage given to the evil mage by the player's unconscious condition is now voided and if a monster has multi-attack they are an immediate threat to a downed player as they can all but auto kill that player if they do get to attack both times on their turn freely dealing out a minimum of four death fails if they hit twice, of course. But even this doesn't tell us the entire picture. Now let's look at that scenario again with two players that can heal with a Paladin and a Bard. The Paladin has, let's say, 15 points of Lay on Hands available, but the Bard has access to Healing Word. So, which do we pick now as the choice becomes a little less clear? The answer is, it still depends. We need more information. Who goes first and how far into the combat are we? If we are, say, several rounds into the combat and the ghoul is already close to dropping, then we probably want to get the paladin up, as that will most likely result in a huge swing in armor class against the attacking ghoul, removing their advantage and forcing melee attacks against the paladin's very high armor. The paladin should probably use their action to try and finish off the ghoul if possible, particularly if they already have extra attack. Whereas, say, if the ghoul hasn't taken any damage yet at all, it's probably wiser to get up the bard so that they might be able to help attack the caster with the bow and then their ranged bonus action can help heal the paladin when he comes up and then inevitably drops back down. Shifting over slightly, one of the biggest areas that can be improved on for healers is timing. This is our third strategy that we really need to master. Who to heal is a lot easier to figure out than when to heal, especially when you start taking into consideration the balance between offense and defense. So the question is, is when do we proactively heal? Well, first off, it's usually, though not always, okay to go for offense in the first two to three actions for your enemies. Notice I said actions and not rounds there, because your party might get surprised or roll poorly on initiative, and, and I don't want a bunch of people saying, well, <laughs> Cody told me to just cast Sacred Flame all I want in the first two rounds. Sorry, bro. What we're looking for is not to top off our allies inside of combat, but just to keep them on their feet. One hit point is the same as 61 hit points when our allies make attacks. But our job is to keep them making those attacks. If they're going to be able to attack again and survive through the next round, there's really no reason to force us to heal. It's better if we continue to help them eliminate one of our opponents and then reduce their action economy. Depending on our class and abilities, it might even be better to help try to control the board and reduce the number of incoming attacks with the spell like Hold Person or Charm Monster. This, of course, brings us to our next strategy, which is tracking your party's health and enemy damage. Now, I know that might seem controversial on the surface to my fellow dungeon masters out there, but let me explain. I don't mean literally track your party's exact health. I mean, pay attention to the game and take note of huge amounts of damage being heaped onto one of your players. Paying attention to your party's health in play is not metagaming. Remember, your character would be seeing and hearing the entirety of the fight to the death around them. I've been a dungeon master for over 20 years, not just playing, but actually behind the screen. And having an idea of what your fighter's health might be around after a huge crit from an ogre, 
That's not metagaming. Metagaming is when we go on break in the middle of a combat round and I come back to the Zoom chat with my cup of water refilled to find my paladin and my wizard planning out the next two rounds of combat and how they will each position. Now that's fucking metagaming. Also, you should be paying attention to how much damage the enemy is dealing out. Are they hitting your fighter for 10 each time they connect or for 15? How many attacks are those enemies making each turn. That information will help us understand their total threat level and pay attention to how your DM announces that damage. This is very easily overlooked. Listen for keywords from your DM, particularly like the word only. This is an advanced level tip, guys. Only should be an immediate red flag trigger for you. If your dungeon master says, and the hill giant rakes his huge club across in a wide sweep at your chest, he hits with a 19 and does only 12 points of damage. That is a huge auditory clue. That tells us right now that the dungeon master expected the damage to be higher than what was rolled, meaning the roll was probably very low compared to its maximum, and that you should take that into consideration when gauging your proactive healing targets, because the next hit will almost certainly be higher, potentially much, much higher. The next strategy I wanna talk about is Healing potions. Simply put, you don't need them and you don't want them. It is a rookie mistake for the party to go, okay, uh, here, everyone take one healing potion since we just bought four. Or even much, much worse than that, just to give them all to the healer because that's their job. This is terribly wrong. While your job might be to fulfill the role of the healer for the party, healing potions should always be carried by someone else. Why? because if they go down, you have healing spells and abilities. But if you go down, now they have to spend time running over to you, fumbling through your pack, costing them precious action economy, and forcing you into potentially unnecessary death saving throws, which always have the potential to critically fail. So when can you carry a healing potion or two? I'd say after everyone else in your party has a minimum of two. If everyone has two potions already, okay, fine. You can take one before giving someone else a third one. Otherwise, you just don't need to carry them at all. Worst case, you can always take a potion in between combats if need be. But in the, in the heat of the battle, it's always better for the rogue, the ranger, the warlock, and the barbarian to carry those things instead of you. Our next strategy is all about managing those spell slots and abilities. This is tricky. There's no doubt about it. And no matter what you decide and how practiced you are, you're going to hold spell slots when you should have used them and you're gonna use them when you should have held them. But that doesn't mean that we can't work on our timing to try and minimize those issues. The key to managing your spell slots is evaluating your enemies threat level correctly. As an example, a big scary boss type that nearly one shots your rogue and attacks three times is a sign that you might be a little looser with your spells. Why? Because of the word nearly and the unlikelihood that the boss will be able to bring several party members down in the same turn. And remember, in combat, one hit point is enough unless you can out heal an entire round of potential incoming damage. However, if the party is surrounded by a horde of enemies, obviously that might change things. First off, how hard are the attackers hitting? Are they doing six to eight damage per hit? Something you might be able to outheal two hits worth? Okay, maybe play a little bit more offensively with your spell slots. Or are they hitting very hard and there's a good chance they might be able to drop two party members in the same turn just because of how strong they are. Okay, now you might need to back off and supplement your party's damage with cantrips and good value but low damage spells like spiritual weapon. Thus, saving your higher level slots for that in case of emergency break glass moment with like a mass healing word or something similar. And finally, that brings us to our last strategy which is to always be in position. What does that mean? It means it's your job as the party's healer to work around your teammates 
and the position that they set up in. Your allies will position themselves as best they can to cast burning hands and gain flanking bonuses. Perhaps they will even slip past the front line to challenge an enemy caster in the back. Your job is to move not based on your enemies that you see, but based on your allies' positioning. As the party's dedicated healer, you want to position yourself nearest the exit if possible, but not so far away that you couldn't reach any player should they suddenly have a dire need for healing. Also, you should be aware of potential area of effect attacks and try to move to the side of the main tank off 15 to 20 feet if possible. This gives you the opportunity opportunity to move up and deliver a touch healing spell and still give you some flexibility with a few feet of leftover movement to move back. This is particularly important if you and your party rely on the tank using something like, say, the sentinel feet. For farther away allies, try to roam in between them if possible so you can use channels and similar AoE healing. But if nothing else, make sure you are close enough to get to any ally to heal them if they drop. So if you only have touch range healing, you need to push forward. Whereas if you can safely rely on healing from a range with a spell like, say, Healing Word, a very powerful effect, you have more room to then back off. If you are using offensive concentration spells to aid your party when you fire off healing, like say Spirit Guardians, do not move past the tank or the melee fighters just to get that one more enemy in the AoE. It's better to guarantee that you'll keep your spell going than it is to get that last 3d8, especially when the enemy might just save for half anyway. And lastly, always try to keep two allies in front of you if possible. This is naturally easily done in corridors and tight tunnels, but I've seen plenty of healers end up out of position in much wider spaces where enemies may even approach them from multiple angles. And this can happen more easily if you end up uh, beating your teammates on initiative. Remember, you don't have to move your full speed. This is a rookie mistake, particularly past doorways. If your move is 30 feet and you go first, only move 20 feet into that room. That way, if you need to retreat the following turn, if your party suddenly finds themselves outgunned and outnumbered, you can then move past the doorway 10 feet, leaving plenty of room for your tanks and melee types to stand in front of a funnel of enemies. Everything here is what I would call the fundamentals. And by practicing these fundamentals and putting them all together, you can become a true master healer, keeping your party alive long enough to actually see the end of the campaign. All right, now I wanna pass it over to you guys in the community. What advice do you have for players excited about taking on the role of the party's healer? Are you the party's healer? Does your party even have a dedicated healer anymore or do you just heal by committee? Let me know. I, of course, want to give a massive thank you to all the incredible patrons over at welcomeadventures.com. Guys, thank you so much. It's because of what you do that I get to keep doing what I love to do. And so for that, I am just incredibly grateful. If you guys enjoy what I do here, you want to support more content like this, check out welcomeadventures.com. Uh, it's a wonderful way to support the channel and snag some rewards for yourself. If this is your first time here and you love role-playing games, or maybe you're learning to love role-playing games, I would love to have you subscribe. I put out videos on GM tips, player tips, tutorials, and more. So if that sounds like something you might be interested in, just hit that subscribe button down below and come join us. Guys, be sure to check out the Taking 20 Discord for more advice. And other than that, I just wanna say thank you so much for watching. My name is Cody, and I hope your games are filled with wonderful, wonderful memories and even better friends. I'll catch you guys next time. Yeah.